your host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Dennis McKenna. Dennis is an ethnopharmacologist. He has a PhD from the University of British Columbia in botanical sciences, and he's held several academic positions over the years at places like Stanford University and the University of Minnesota. He's also the author of several books. One of them, which is about to come out with its second edition, is The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, which is all about his life with his brother Terence McKenna. And Terence and Dennis had many interesting and fascinating psychedelic adventures together over over the years. They are arguably two of the most famous psychonauts that anyone knows about. Uh, his brother Terence was active as a, a lecturer and speaker and writer in the 80s and 90s mostly, and he passed away in the year 2000. And so Dennis shared a lot about Terence and their relationship together, uh, what it was like growing up and, and where they came from, some of their infamous experiences with psilocybin mushrooms in the Amazon, and some of the weird and strange ideas that came from those experiences. He talked about some of their early experiences with DMT in California. And we talked about other topics related to psychedelics, uh, culture, and society. We talked about, you know, the, the therapeutic efficacy of psychedelic experiences in terms of their clinical effects and the ways they're being studied today. We talked about some of their intellectual influences, people like Carl Jung, and how the ideas of Jung and others influenced how they had their psychedelic experiences over the years and how they interpreted them. We talked about things like the relationship between humans and plants and other aspects of nature. You know, he shared his ideas on everyone having the right to symbiosis to interact with not just each other as humans, but with other species, including mushrooms. We talked about his ideas and thoughts around things like drug prohibition and education and the proper orientation we should have towards psychoactive drugs as a society and how he thinks the clinical and medical use of psychedelics will co-evolve with the recreational and personal use of psychedelics moving forward. Forward. And he shared a lot of interesting advice and some of his philosophy on life towards the end of the show. If you don't have the time or the patience to listen to the whole episode, I think I do recommend maybe skipping to the last, you know, 30 minutes approximately. We cover a number of topics in that last 30 minutes, and I think it really gels together a lot uh, really well at the end. And so skip ahead to the, the last, again, 30 minutes of the episode if you don't have time for the whole thing. And don't forget to check out Dennis's book, The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can make Mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mindandmatter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure, and vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Hey everyone, I want to take a minute to tell you about a really cool health monitoring device I've been using for several weeks. It's called Lumen, and it's a handheld, pocket-sized device with a sleek design. It measures CO2 levels in your breath, which allows their technology to determine the extent to which your body is burning fats versus carbohydrates. Lumen helps improve your metabolic flexibility, your body's efficiency in shifting between using fats and carbs. It improves your ability to burn fat, which decreases your hunger levels and makes your body less dependent on snacking, and it can increase your energy levels by helping you develop a high-functioning metabolism. I use this device in the morning, before bed, and after meals and workouts to track my metabolism. With just a couple weeks of use, I learned a lot about which foods were causing my body to burn mostly fat, mostly carbs, or both, as well as how long I need to fast each day to promote fat burning. 
Lumen is great for anyone looking to optimize their health for either weight loss or athletic performance. The easy to use app allows you to track your results together with what you're eating and how you're exercising, and it syncs with other devices like the Apple Watch. Click the link in the episode description to learn more and use the code MIND, M-I-N-D, in all capital letters to get $50 off your Lumen device today. And with that, here's my conversation with Dennis McKenna. To you. So who are you and, and what are you best known for? <laughs> well, I'm probably best known for being Terrence McKenna's younger brother. I mean, honestly, <laughs> you know, and I wrote this book uh, really... I mean, the subtitle is My Life with Terrence McKenna. Uh, But uh, Terrence has been gone for 23 years, which makes me, you know, is kind of sobering when you look back on it, that it's been so long. On the other hand, he's still very much part of the cultural conversation. He's achieved this certain immortality, cyber immortality on the web. You know, I mean, his stuff is all over YouTube. And and even though a lot of that was from ni- the mid-90s, it's still very timely, you know, because he was a guy that was very much ahead of his time and very much focused on the future. Uh, so that's our association. But then I went on. I mean, I, I have had my own career in what uh, you might call ethnopharmacology. And uh, I uh, investigated uh, ayahuasca. I conducted a biomedical. Why is that coming up? I conducted a biomedical uh, research project on ayahuasca in the early 90s with the UDV. Uh, and my thesis uh, in at... Uh, uh, my thesis work at the University of British Columbia focused on, on ayahuasca and another very obscure uh, psychedelic that few people have heard of called ukuhe. Uh, they more people have heard of it now because I've talked about it. It 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 it's another orally active form of DMT, but comes from completely different plant sources. And, uh, you know, ayahuasca is made from this combination of Banisteriopsis and, and Psychotria viridis, Chakruna. And so it's a, it's orally, it's DMT potentiated by beta carbolates. And Ukuhe, in my investigations, the question was, one of the central questions was, is that the same? Is it the same mechanism? Because varola is the main ingredient of ukuhe, which is used by the Witoto, and it's a dying tradition. I mean, it's not uh, not a popular thing at all. Ayahuasca is like, uh, you know, a global superstar now. Nobody's ever heard of ukuhe uh, except a few ethnopharmacologists and, and, like I say, other people that, but anyway, Varola is used as snuff in different parts of the Amazon, primarily by the Yanomami. And the reason for that is that, you know, snuffs don't have this issue about oral activity. You know, I mean, it, they're parenterally taken. So this was interesting. Ukuhe was interesting to me when I was doing my research because it's another tryptamine-containing plant uh, you know, preparation, but from completely different botanical sources. So the central uh, sort of hypothesis, if you could call it that, of the research, of my research is, is it the same mechanism? In other words, is you know, there are beta carbolines in Ukuhe that are similar to those in in, uh, in uh, ayahuasca? And is that the basis of the mechanism? And it turns out it's not so clear that it is the same. You know, there are very few beta carbolines. There are, are beta carbolines in Ukuhe, but very sh- trace amounts effectively. And yet it is orally active. Um, so 
I never really did nail down why that was, but I think why it was was because the the tryptamines in Ukuhe are basically DMT and 5-methoxy DMT, you know, in very high amounts. So these things are, uh, you know, they are substrates for monoamine oxidase. But it may be that... Uh, Effectively, they inhibit monoamine oxidase, so they do enable it to be absorbed in the, uh, you know, in the orally active form. That was the supposition. That was what I concluded. I don't know that people are interested in those details, but anyway, that was the finding of my mm. research. And uh, yeah. on this. so yeah, so you're you're you know an ethnopharmacologist by profession. You're you're the brother of the the famous or the infamous Terence McKenna, and I think many of the listeners will have some familiarity with who Terence was, but I don't think all of them will have very much will will have much familiarity. So, can you give a, a brief overview before we kind of go through your lives together in different ways of of who Terence McKenna was and what, what was he best known for and when was he active when he was an adult? Well, Terence, you know, we are famous together for for a lot of the events early in life, which are described in the book, you know, I mean, uh, as, as, you know, I was a teenager in the decade, I was born in 1950, right? So the sixties were my adolescent years. Terrence was four years older than me, uh, just old enough to lead me down the primrose path in many of these ways. I I don't think of it that way. He he introduced me to some very interesting things, and he was that much older. And in the sixties, you know, we you know the sixties was an era where there was a great deal of interest in psychedelics, but there was basically LSD. Uh, there was much else. Occasionally, one ran across mescaline. And occasionally, very occasionally, we you you heard about DMT, but it was almost legendary. But uh, 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 Terence was uh, pretty good at working the matrix, and so he was able to get DMT. And we were both quite fascinated by that uh, because it seemed to be a just an order of magnitude stranger than LSD, you know, which was plenty strange, but DMT was a whole different thing, you know. And uh, so we were fascinated by it and wanted to look into it further. But the uh, the uh, the thing with DMT that was surprising to us, I should change my here, uh, never mind. Sorry. Uh, the thing that was disappointing, not exactly disappointing, but I'd say frustrating about DMT uh, was that it, it's so short, you know, like these, like 5-methoxy and, and DMT, you have to smoke them. They last 15 or 20 minutes pretty much, and then they very quickly go away. Mm hmm and one of the issues that we had was we wanted to uh, be in that place longer. We actually thought of it as another place, accurately or not. And we were just we were frustrated because you couldn't. By the time you got into the DMT space, it was already fading. So we became interested in a a longer term, some sort of we thought an orally active form of DMT might last longer and give us more time to uh, explore that place. And at that time, in the 68, 69, 70 uh, period, the pharmacology of ayahuasca was not really well understood. You know, it wasn't understood. It was understood that there were beta carbolines in it. It wasn't really understood that the the you know the admixture plants the DMT admixture plants were the important component. This was all sort of a black box at that point. You know, I mean, it was quickly under it was quickly elucidated around the same time, but we didn't know that at that time. So 
we stumbled on a paper by Richard Schulte, the famous uh, Harvard ethnobotanist. Uh, and the name, the, the title of the paper was Varola as an Orally Active Hallucinogen. And uh, so when we found out about this, when we found this article, we thought, aha, this, this, is, this is the secret. We thought of it as the secret. We thought this is what we need to go find, you know? And so that was the, the motivation for our decision to go to South America in 1971, looking for this Ukuhe. Uh, and the reason we went to La Chirera was because uh, La Chirera was the ancestral home of the Witoto people. And they were the ones that had this thing. So it was a pretty, you know, it, it, we just decided that there was nothing in our world more important than than that. That's what we wanted to do. So we basically quit our jobs. Not that we had jobs. Well, I was, actually, actually, Dennis, um, I think that's a that's actually like a perfect teaser for where I want to go, um, which okay. is exactly where you're going right now. But before we get there, I do want to back up and talk about some of your earlier years with Terrence. And if you could, um, you know, some some. Uh, some part of the um, listener base will probably not be too familiar with Terrence. If you had to give someone like the, the 10 to 20 second elevator pitch on who Terrence McKenna was, just to give them a basic idea, what, what would it be? Who he was? Yeah. What was he famous for? Well, you know, we both became famous or, you know, he became famous. He, we both became famous for, you know, this trip that we did to La yeah. Chirera in search of these things. And then he turned that into a career as a kind of cultural commentator, philosopher, that sort of thing. And I went towards science, you know. I mean, we came back from that experience, you know, with a different perspective. Mm -hmm. and uh, And I wanted to pursue... The nuts and bolts of uh, of these things, and 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 this was what led me to go into ethnopharmacology to would, and study botany and chemistry and all the things related to that. Terence, uh, as a result of the experiences that we had in La Chirera, which are described in the book, was all ready to reject science. You know, he was like saying. Science will never explain this stuff, you know, the things that happen to us. It will not, science is not up to the task of explaining what happened. And uh, and I was sort of, say, I was saying, well, wait a minute, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, mm -hmm. science can carry us a certain distance to understand that. And at the time we went to La Chirera, we were not scientists, you know, I mean, we may have fancied that we were scientists, but we weren't really scientists. We were a couple of curious, nerdy kids from Colorado with a fascination with psychedelics. You know, and so I wanted to look at the at the at the basis of the you know the formulation of ukuhe and other things. Terence rejected all that, and you know became a a spec you know more of a philosopher and a speculator one of the things that of many ideas crazy ideas or interesting ideas that came out of Lancherera was his ideas about time and he mm. became famous for this uh the time wave zero idea and we wrote a book together in 1975 called the invisible landscape uh, mind hallucinogens and the I Ching. He came up with this. He had in the in the prolonged altered states that we had at La Chirera, which actually had nothing to do with Ukuhe. Ukuhe was a false herring, a red herring sort of. When we it, when we got to La Chirera uh, in search of Ukuhe. What we found at La Chirera was uh, pastures uh, full of mushrooms, which we had almost no experience with. 
at the time, you know, but we knew what they were and uh, we got into them, you know, you've read the story. So we got into them probably a bit too much, but they quickly, you know, we started eating them a lot daily and at substantial doses and they quickly rearranged our priorities, you know, in, in a sense, we were thinking, and we set out to look for Ukuhe. When we got to La Terra, we found Psilocybe cubensis uh, growing out of every cow pie in the pasture, practically. It was the rainy season. So we started, uh, uh, sorry about that. I cannot suppress that, damn it. Oh, that's high. I, I could barely, barely hear it. Okay, uh, uh, so we started eating these, and uh, they downloaded a bunch of ideas, I guess you could say, about things we could do, you know, a, a biophysical experience, uh, experiment. We called it the experiment at La Cherera. It wasn't really an experiment. It didn't have the kind of, you know, it probably should be called the the, the ritual at La Cherera more than the experience of La, of the experiment at La Cherera. But anyway, we consumed these mushrooms in great quantities and it downloaded a whole bunch of crazy ideas about things that we could do based on the imitation of a sound in our heads that we could hear at high doses of mushrooms. And uh, people can read about that. I don't really want to delve into it too much because I've I've talked about it a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but the and you know you can look on the McKenna Academy website or you know there are various places that you can uh, the McKenna Academy website we actually did a retrospective on La Cherera in uh, 2021. So uh people can explore that at uh, you know, McKenna Academy, McKenna dot Academy, they can explore that anyway <laughs> to bring the thread back. So we came back with a lot of crazy ideas, you know, or, or a lot of interesting ideas, possibly crazy as well. But one of those was Terence's ideas about time uh, and the idea you know, the ideas that he later developed into the time wave theory and this mathematical treatment of the I Ching, the kernel of those ideas came out of our experiences at La Cherera. And then he actually spent decades uh, kind of developing and building on this idea that the time wave, as he constructed it, was really a map of the texture of time and could be used to predict the future and the past could be, could be laid across. And it was, it was the, the uh, presumption was that the hypothesis was that this theory described the ingression of novelty into the continuum. The idea that, there are actually new things under the sun every day, that there are novel events. And this time wave described the ingression of novelty into the continuum of reality. And this idea really is borrowed in, in, in some ways, although we, we didn't know it in the, in the process of, of learning or investigating it, we found out that, you know, Al Alfred North Whitehead uh, the uh, 20th century philosopher had had talked about this in his in his you know magnum opus. He he wrote a lot of interesting things, but process and reality is uh, his major work, and and so he provided a framework for our ideas. The idea that you can that novelty does ingress into the continuum. And, and what the time wave brought to that was that you could actually major, measure this to a certain extent. You could quantify this. And it was a fractal, and it had an end. And that was the, uh, you know, much of the discussion subsequently over four decades almost was 
when is the when does time end? When does the singularity that time is an, is a collapsing spiral? You know, it's a it's a fractal that actually comes to an end. And uh, much of the discussion in uh, sort of cultural uh, uh, meme sphere, where these th- these ideas were being talked about, and there was a group called the Novelty Group. Much of the discussion is about when. When is time going to end? And uh, there were, in the course of sorting out these ideas, there were various uh, endpoints postulated. Uh, But eventually he settled on December 21st, uh, 2012, as being the the end date for the for the appearance of a singularity, whatever that was, and the collapse of the space-time continuum or the transition to some other kind of, you know, state of reality. And coincidentally or not, I think it was only partly coincidentally, but it was, uh, that happened to be a very important date in the Mayan calendar. Some have said, you know, and there was a lot of discussion about December 21st, 2012, because it's the end of a major cycle in 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 the Mayan calendar, and uh, it was only later that we under that you know this came to light. But when that piece of data came surfaced, then Terence you know settled on December twenty first, twenty twelve, as the definitive end date. Mm-hmm. Of course, he did not live to see that, and uh, and we're still here. So that in some ways that disproved the theory. I mean, if there was ever a, you know, it made a prediction and it failed spectacularly, you know. (laughs) So in that sense, uh, you know, maybe this speculation, well, it was obviously incorrect, you know, Uh, if if that was the criterion. I I am not, uh, I was always a spectator uh, sort of a, a skeptic about the time wave, you know, and we used to have lively discussions, Terence and I, you might even say arguments, but let's call them lively discussions about the nature of novelty and how does novelty manifest in the continuum, you know, and uh, I was, I, I, I was and still am, open to the idea that novelty does emerge in time uh you know but but he was he, he was focused on the dramatic events and i was my perspective was novelty doesn't erupt into the continuum you know it leaks into the continuum it's a slow process which you don't even notice generally until something happens that's definitely novel. And one of the one of the examples of this is the first detonation of the atomic bomb. You know, I mean, Terence said, "Well, I mean, that was a novel event for sure, and it was a novel event, but there were uh, there was a whole series of novel events that no one noticed that that led up to that." you know, Einstein's theories of relativity, all the work that was done on nuclear fission and at Chicago uh, by Oppenheimer and others, all of these laid the groundwork for the, for, you know, the technology that led to the atomic bomb. So when the atomic bomb was eventually detonated, yes, that was very novel, but there was a, a bunch of things that had to happen that to make that possible so this was the crux of the difference in our perspective on it and uh uh but in the end you know this this eruptive novel event that was projected for december 21st 2012 uh didn't happen obviously we're still here you know so the space-time continuum or whatever singularity was supposed to happen did not 
or it happened and nobody noticed, which is unlikely. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, so so that was kind of the the test of the novelty theory, and it failed in, in that respect. That yeah. said, though, it was a very interesting uh, sort of mathematical construct that that could be you know applied to history the 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 trick was the the problem was with the time wave was was perpetually if it has an end where do you put the end point you know how to get an accurate uh uh overlay of historical events and even you know cosmic events because the time wave you know really in its larger cycles went back to the birth of the universe, but how do you accurately lay it across the span of time of known events? And uh, Terence's approach to this was to identify these significant uh, historical events, like, like the detonation of the atomic bomb or the collapse of, you know, Roman civilization or whatever it might be, these these very impactful events. In the end, I uh, one of the problems that I had with with the time wave, which uh you know, maybe I'm getting into the weeds too far on this. You can yeah, I, I think we're going to yeah, I think <laughs> you know, so you guys went to La Terre and you, you had these incredible experiences with probably more magic mushrooms than almost anyone on earth has ever taken. And, you know, I, I'm actually curious. And so your book, so that's a lot of that stuff is first is talked about in that book that you mentioned, the invisible landscape, which you guys wrote way back in the day. You mm -hmm. have this new book called the brotherhood of the screaming abyss, which is about your entire life with Terrence. Right. And, you know, one of the things that actually um, caught my attention in the book that you mentioned um, before you even got to the La Trera stuff is you were talking about DMT and you said in some ways that DMT is what the book is all about. And I'm curious, when did you and Terrence first encounter DMT and, and what was sort of the, the set and setting for that? When did it happen? Where did it happen? And, and how did that influence you? Yeah. So the set, so, uh, uh Terrence was living in, uh, Terrence finished his last two years of high school in, in the Bay area in Menlo park. And uh, he uh, fell in with uh, a group of what you might say ultra nerds in a certain way, you know, very intelligent, but very weird people, you know, which is which is exactly what he went out there for. You know, he wanted to connect with, you know, strange ideas and was fascinated with psychedelics anyway through some of the people that he knew uh in high school and and then shortly after high school in menlo park he was able to find dmt actually stanford research institute was doing experiments with dmt at that time and one of his close friends had some connections to Stanford Research Institute and was able to, you know, boost some DMT from their research lab. And <laughs> then Terrence tried that and said, "By God, you know this this is this is more than a psychedelic. This is like the ultimate metaphysical reality, you know, pill or whatever. It's not a pill, but but this is this is about this is about a." opening portals to other dimensions you know and uh and i being the little brother i was brought along to this uh, a few years later he shared it with me and it's probably worth mentioning that both terence and i in our adolescent years we were very much immersed in science fiction <laughs> you know and science fiction more than spirituality or uh, fascination with uh, eth ethnographic practices, shamanism, and all that. I mean, we read about all those things, but our framework was really born out of science fiction, and we actually thought of the places, the the DMT state, as a, another dimension, another place, 
and that that DMT opened up and that you could actually go. This was, uh, and this was our, this was the basis of our wish to be able to spend more time there so that we could actually explore this dimension a little more. And uh, so that was our fascination with it, that this, this was, you know, I mean, LSD was interesting, but LSD was nothing compared to DMT at the time in our, in our estimation. So this was the motivation of our, desire to uh you know to to find a more sustained form of dmt and and the thing is when when we eventually when we got to lachera you know we we had come for ukuhe but then the mushrooms were there you know and in some ways the mushrooms are the perfect orally active form of dmt you know uh, psilocybin and psilocin. Psilocin is the active ingredient of psilocin. Is psilocybin is converted to psilocin in the body? It's psilocin that that interacts with the receptors, and psilocin chemically is very close to DMT. You know, it's four hydroxy dimethyltryptamine. That trivial molecular difference makes it orally active. And at high doses, the, the psilocybin, psilocybin, psilocybin state is a lot like DMT. I mean, that's because it's the same dimension, if you want to put it that way. And again, we were thinking of these things in terms of a dimension, but let's call it the tryptamine space. You know, a lot of these things, DMT, 5-methoxy DMT, it turns out, also uh, 5-hydroxy DMT or bofotenine, all of these have a very similar uh, phenomenology, you know, and so you could say that they're, you know, they open up the tryptamine space, this family of chemicals, because they all interact similarly to the, with the, uh, with the 5-HT2A receptors, which are the target for, all of these true psychedelics, what I call true psychedelics, those are the key, uh, that's the key uh, serotonin receptor subtype that all the true psychedelics interact with. And the tryptamines are, you know, they they all do that. And the experiences are similar with all of them. <clears throat> so anyway, uh, yeah, psilocybin, if you want to study the the tryptamine space, it's almost the ideal tool, you know, because it does last hours instead of minutes. Um, it's very non toxic. It's very compatible with human metabolism, and you know, it's a kick ass psychedelic, <laughs> and it's uh, it's uh, you know, at high doses, it can be uh, you know quite quite overwhelming. Uh, but it's not threatening to uh, metabolism. You know, our bodies uh, really have evolved to uh, handle molecules like this. Yeah. And, and how, how as, much... you, as you well know, DMT, methoxy, yeah. they occur in the how, brain as well. So, how, like when when you and Terence were taking like the highest doses of psilocybin mushrooms that you took, if it was at La Terrera or or anywhere else. How much do you estimate you were taking per dose, and and what was the phenomenology like? Well, it was very hard to say because these were these were fresh mushrooms. These were growing in the pasture. We weren't drying them. It's hard to say, but I would say, you know. Uh, but if like a standard, say, recreational dose today is is on the order of half of an eighth of an ounce of dried mushrooms. You know, are are you a, are you double that? Or are you well, well, well above that? Well, Terence always talked about five dried grams as the heroic dose. You know, that mm -hmm. was his estimate of the heroic dose. It's a pretty strong dose. There are people now that take even more than that, and I think it's uh, it's a testimony to the, not, the lack of toxicity of psilocybin 
that you can pretty much increase the dose to higher levels. You know, I mean, there I know people who have taken, you know, 10, 15, 20 grams, dried grams of, uh, of wow. psilocybin, you know, or even more. I think that at a certain point, you reach a place where the whole the whole receptor system is probably saturated mm. and uh you take more but you don't get a you mm -hmm. don't get more effect but, but you would have point. been taking more than like a five dried gram heroic dose you think at la charrera i yeah. would say so i would i mean i don't know what it was but if there's a roughly one to ten ratio and uh you know 10 gra 10 wet grams is a is about equivalent to one dried gram roughly i mean it's 90 percent water mm -hmm. you know uh, and so i think these doses were probably in the 10 to 15 dried gram level they were sufficient let's put it that way they were definitely sufficient sufficient they did the trick and and what was i mean what was the experience like well, the experience was, uh, you know, what what we focused on in this in this state and in this special place was that these at these uh, very high doses we could hear a sound uh, inside our heads that we could uh, listen to, and it wasn't clear where it came from. It was kind of like an electrical buzzing kind of sound, and something that we can you experience on the on uh, on DMT sometimes. You know, uh, Terence once characterized it as crackling cellophane, and it was something like that. And this sound would show up at these high doses, and we found that we could imitate this uh, sound. We could actually try to sing the sound and at a certain if you, you you could reach a point where you could just lock in on this sound it was hard to imitate but once you locked in on it it would just sort of pour out of you uh, and uh, you couldn't really stop it and there seemed to be a visual strong synesthesia synesthesia effect i mean you made the sound but you could see the sound at the same time you could see something and this is common with with psychedelics particularly with psilocybin synesthesia but we could actually project the sound and see apparently a you know a visual representation of it so that a, a visual component and that got us speculating about you know all the things we talked about in the book about hyper uh, translinguistic matter and all this that you know we could actually use the sound as a kind of energy wave to manifest our vision on the in 3d space so that anybody could see this you didn't have to be on mushrooms to see it you know at least that's what we thought and uh uh so that experience with the sound and imitating the sound and then the mushroom at this point i mean you've dragged me into talking about this even though i don't want to go into details but the mushroom got us into a place there was a very strong noetic component to the experiences you know a, a sense of being in touch with a non-human intelligence whether it was the mushrooms or something channeling through the mushrooms it was downloading all this information about this experiment that we could do that if you make this sound in the right circumstances you can set up you know you can do what's effectively a transformation of your own dna you know, you can set up a resonance with your own DNA and produce a produce an object of a physical object that was made out of matter and mind. You know, so affecting this union of matter and mind, so that you could create an object 
that was, you know, that you could see it and be it at the same time. And this is, you know, there are analogies to this in occult literature, alchemical literature particularly. You know, Philosopher's Stone is very much that idea or the idea of the scrying mirror or, you know, there is in the uh, sort of esoteric occult traditions, the, you know, allusions to an artifact that you can create. And we, you know, and it, and and if you could create an artifact like that, it would be pretty much the ultimate artifact. At least this is what was being transmitted to us at La Chirera. You make this thing, and uh, it's capable of doing anything that you can imagine, literally anything that you can imagine. So that's what we were shooting for. And... Uh, when it didn't happen, and it, uh, it it didn't happen because, for well, for a number of reasons, it obviously it didn't happen, or we wouldn't have be having this conversation. And it didn't happen because it couldn't happen. You know, it would have had to overturn pretty much every physical law that we know about, and physics is very stubborn about its laws. We were not concerned with that at that time i mean in fact that was the whole the whole idea was that you know if we can create this thing it will basically disrupt history it will be the end of history it will be the ultimate artifact that brings history to an end and uh then we transition into some kind of post historical uh you know mode of of existence and the idea was, you know, the, 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 the framework for the experiment was based on al alchemy primarily. These different stages of alchemy having to do with condensing the stone, you know, through different uh, stages. The idea was that once condensed, you know, you'd actually be able to hold it in your hand or look at it or whatever and yet it would be a combination of mind and matter. It would be a fusion of mind and matter. And uh, you, it would respond to thought, and it would be able to do anything that you imagined. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, we can talk about, I mean, there was obviously whole, whole uh, all kinds of ego inflation and messianic ideation and all this stuff you know, going on, which uh, which I write about in the book. You know, I mean, we were clearly, uh, we were clearly, uh, to put it charitably, we were we were around the bend. We were, you know, deluded, but it, not a, they didn't really understand that at the time. It took a long time to understand that. One of the uh, conundrums about the experiment at La Chirera was we performed the experiment and the experiment predicted that this would happen, you know, at, at the end of imitating this sound on high doses of mushrooms. Well, we did that. You know, we performed this ritual, singing to the mushroom and trying to get this resonance, this superconducting standing waveform made of DNA, our own DMT, DNA and the mushrooms to get that to manifest. Well, that didn't happen, you know. So then the, and so, you know, maybe, well, you know, what, what happened then was we, it, it, it did not condense on schedule, you know. So we thought, well, uh, we've succeeded because there were different anomalous things going on that led us to think that we'd succeeded. But the question then became, we've condensed the stone, but the stone has not, you know, it, it's a question of when will it show up? You know, when is it actually going to manifest? And actually, for decades, the uh, 
that became the question that had to do with the the time wave and the ideas about when is the singularity going to manifest so the you know in some ways uh my brother's preoccupation with the time wave had to do with the appearance of the stone you know when the the high the ampersand we called it or the or the stone when the stone manifests then history is going to end so we had to construct this map of history you know and and, and identify the end state now you know uh this is pretty wild stuff and uh you know i mean i'd like to think that i'm fairly sane now <laughs> but at the time we were participating in this in this delusional process you know one, um, you know one of the things that i remember you know from some old terence mckenna lecture is he used to say things like you know entertain all ideas but commit to none and so and he used to say things like i come to you with this stuff half finished so he, he was very much into um, just entertaining all ideas and bringing them to people half baked, and just right. you know, he he sort of just loved surfing the edge of knowledge, even if you know the ideas didn't turn out to be you know validated or they didn't turn out to be true. Um, right. And you know, I mean, one of the things that's amazing is you know, if you go on YouTube or Google or whatever, and you just look up Terence McKenna lectures, there is hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of hours with stuff still coming out to this day. It seems, and. He, I mean, he must have been on the road speaking all the time, and he mm -hmm. was on the in, he was on the internet so early that right. you know, well ahead of almost anyone else. Do you do you think that if he would have lived longer, he would have been like you know one of the first big podcasters or or something like that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I would say he was already. You know, I mean, that was before we even had the word, you know, to characterize it, but effectively. You know, his he was one of the first big podcasters of the world. You know, the interesting thing about the internet is once this stuff is up there, it lives forever, you know, and Terence has achieved this this kind of virtual immortality. You know, people can can bring this stuff up and listen to his raps, and he was such a good rapper he was so articulate and he was so able to make this stuff seem plausible and uh, and present it so well you know i used to kid him i mean i used to tell him you know he never wanted me to he was always uncomfortable if i would sit in on his public events when he was talking because i was the only person that would stand up and say, well, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> what you just said was bullshit and it directly contradicts what you said 20 minutes ago, which was also bullshit. <laughs> and not, I didn't say it that unkindly, but, but, uh, you know, I was the only person that really people seem, and I told him, you know, it's not what you say, you know, it's the way you say it. You know, it's that voice. It's the way you deliver it. You could be reading the phone book. Yeah. People would hold on to every word because your delivery is so, like, mesmerizing. That was his gift, you know? Yeah, he was almost like an intellectual stand-up comedian or something like that. Something like, like that. Yeah. yeah, it was just very artful, the way that he spoke. People have called him the thinking man's Timothy Leary. And in some ways, he was. I mean, the ideas were great. And I think he reached a point, you know, in his career where maybe he didn't take it that seriously, but he was having fun with it, you know. And he was mm -hmm. having fun presenting mind-stretching ideas, you know, because it wasn't confined to this. You know, you've listened probably to lots of his stuff. And he was very well read in all these esoteric, all this esoteric stuff, magic, alchemy, shamanism, you name it, esoteric traditions, far more than I was, I, you know, I am. And he could bring all this stuff together. And uh, he could come up with the, you know, the craziest ideas and present them in, uh, in a way that seemed uh, convincing 
And he didn't come off as a wild, raving maniac, you know, uh, which some people would have. He could pre present it very calmly, and it all seemed to make sense, you know. And it was only later that people might reflect and say, well, wait a minute, what was he saying? This doesn't make any sense, <laughs> you know. So it's it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, in some ways, I... You know, I mean, the, the 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 premises of the whole time wave thing and the and the ingression of novelty, uh, I agree with that. I mean, all you have to do is look around to see that things are getting weird, you know, and they've been getting weird for a long time, and they're getting weirder and weirder and weirder, and you're reaching a point now where. You could almost see like reality is fragmenting. You know, we've got all these things. We've got the internet, we've got AI, we've got psychedelics, you know. I mean, the world's pretty weird compared to 1971, you yeah. know. Yeah, uh, it's certainly more heterogeneous. Like there's just more variety in every every local slice of 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 space around us. You know, there's, there's very few, uh, you know, it used to be like right. Every small town was its own little cultural universe, but now, you know, everything is injected everywhere from, from technology. Yeah. It seems like it. So in that sense, I think Terrence was right. I think that, I think that novelty, you know, novelty does ingress into the continuum and maybe we are headed towards some kind of, singularity whatever that might be mm -hmm. but people are talking about the singularity and i think people think you know that means something different to uh, you know to everybody but the basic I, I i think the error perhaps not an error exactly but but terence was attempting to quantify this you know through the time wave and, and actually nail down a moment an instant where it all shifts over. And again, this goes back to our different perspectives. You know, he was expecting some some novel event to just collapse the whole quantum mm -hmm. wave. And I was, you know, my argument was it doesn't work that way. You know, novelty is a real thing. It oozes into the continuum. You know, it 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 leaks into the continuum gradually. And then eventually you reach a point where you look around and you say, you know what? Things are just batshit weird around here. And that seems to be what's happening. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, when you were speaking earlier, you know, a lot of these ideas are, are we'll just call them strange, um, you know, or potentially even kooky. Um, but, you know, when you talk about something like the Philosopher's Stone, this object that can do anything, you know, it's it's easy to dismiss that as just sort of this weird, uh, you know, mid medieval, um, you know, thinking from alchemists who, who, you know, were, were people who didn't know all the things that we know today. But at the same time, it sounds remarkably similar to questions that very serious people talk about today around artificial general intelligence yes. and building yeah. technological artifacts that are literally capable of essentially doing anything. And, you know, many serious people think that that's not only possible, but, but will happen within our lifetimes. Do, do you see any parallels between the things you and Terrence were talking about and thinking and the current sort of uh, uh, race to create I, true I, I artificial? Do. I, I do. I, I do indeed. And I, and I think that, uh, I think that some of the ideas or these ideas that Terence was talking about, and uh, I was talking about too, but kind of from a different perspective. But but I think a lot of Terence's ideas were the seed of these ideas that are emerging now because people have listened to that stuff and people with the skills in information science and artificial intelligence and all this this resonates with people and people, you know, with the skills can say, well, yeah, we can create an artificial intelligence that is, you know, we, we can, we can, and it's what people have always done. It's, you know, what humans are good at is visualizing something, imagining something. I mean, the imagination is what separates, I think, us as humans, us as human primates 
from everybody else, the fact that we have an imagination and the imagination, the word itself describes what it is, image in nation. We're able to create internal representations of reality. And we create a reality hallucination, if you will. And we can then take those ideas and we can project them into the real world because we have opposable thumbs and, you know, we have the right tools. We can master technology so somebody can imagine an artificial intelligence, you know, which is made of data, basically. They can build that and uh, and they're doing that. And it's actually quite terrifying, <laughs> you know, because the, these things are... Uh, you know, any technology is a, is a two-edged sword, and uh, it can be, and, uh, you know, everybody's terrified of uh, artificial intelligence. Not everybody, but some people, and I, uh, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm terrified of it, but I'm certainly wary of it. It's happening whether we're afraid of it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, these it's yeah. emerging. Very hard to know where it's going to go. Another you know? um, another interesting mechanism that stuck with me that I, th I think is one of the more interesting ideas um, that he had or, or metaphors he used was was around what culture is. And he used to say things like, you know, culture is not your friend. Culture is your operating system. And so it's this metaphor of human culture being like an operating system. And the operating system is controlling what's not only what you think, but what's you could even potentially think. And so, what was that idea, and, and where do you where does it come from, and, and and how do you interpret it? I think the same thing. Social media. He was talking about social media and other things. You know, I mean the the information sphere that we inhabit, the meme sphere. You know, is this is culture? Now it's been. Uh, instantiated in high, in cyberspace, and uh, uh, you know the the social media sphere is uh, uh, you know an example of this culture. I don't think. I mean, I don't. I don't think you can escape from culture. I mean, you can't go live in a cave someplace. Some people can. Even there, they don't escape it. But if you live in this society, in this world, you're immersed in the this cultural operating system. And now much of that has been uploaded into the uh into cyberspace in the in the form of, of uh, the social media environment, you know, and they're even I mean, now, you know, it was Facebook and now they're talking about the metaverse and, you know, augmented reality and all of this stuff. And and so, you know, that that's what I mean when I say in some sense what he predicted is coming true. It's not coming true in the way that he predicted. I don't think it can be quantified, but his imagination his visualization of what this might look like we're seeing that in the in the embryonic stages right now you know this is emerging in the embryonic stages i mean it's frightening and maybe encouraging and and also certainly astonishing how quickly all this uh, new artificial intelligence uh, technology is emerging and spreading throughout society. It's happening so quickly. And it, it's kind of like it was predicted that once this happens, of course, it's going to spread because and it's going to happen fast because all these systems talk to each other and they're self uh, refining and they they're self correcting and so you're seeing evolution of effectively an evolution of the collective consciousness that's been uploaded into cyberspace and you know, i mean it's way beyond anybody's uh ability to control it and that's rather frightening you know, 
maybe it should be maybe it shouldn't be i'm not sure just because someone can control something doesn't mean that you know i mean people control technologies and they do all sorts of terrible things with them you know they do all sorts of wonderful things with them technology inherently is uh i mean uh, my own feeling is the technology is uh uh you know, it's morally neutral. It depends on how we use it. You know, that's up to us. But maybe in the emergence of artificial intelligence, we're seeing this cross the threshold where it's not up to us anymore. Maybe the technology itself, if these artificial intelligence systems are conscious in some way, maybe they're calling the shots or maybe they're making their own decisions. That's rather frightening because uh, it's not clear that uh, it's not clear that they have our interests at heart. You know, uh, they may their idea of uh, their moral compass, if they have one, may be quite different than ours. Uh, this is not to say that our moral compass is necessarily superior. But it does happen to be ours. It happens mm. to be the one that we inhabit and the, the framework from which we, you know, live and make our decisions and so on. Uh, and our 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 moral uh, frameworks may not mean anything to a super intelligent AI system. It may very well have its own agenda. And it's, I mean, I guess this is the basis for you know, many people are in this field are saying, well, you know, this 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 will lead to the extinction of humanity. Maybe yeah. so, maybe not. The transformation, who knows? One of the things that um you also do in your book about about your life with Terence is um you talk about a, a lot of your intellectual influences that that each of you shared and and one of them that I thought was interesting was Carl Jung the psychologist and one of the things you mentioned about him is that you know even though he came out of the Western world and and was a thinker of the Western world he was one of the few Western psychologist who was also well versed in Eastern traditions and Eastern philosophy and you know Eastern and Western intellectual traditions and, and philosophical traditions tend to have a very different view sometimes the opposite view on the nature of mind and matter um you know on the on the, the western side you tend to have people thinking that things are material and that um the mind emerges from a certain kind of material configuration like a brain whereas in the eastern traditions it's oftentimes the opposite that everything is sort of mental or everything is consciousness and what we perceive to be you know nuts and bolts matter is really just one way that that mental processes can manifest so what exactly was the uh, carl jung's influence on your thinking and how did that in, sort of how do you think that informed the way that you guys had your experiences with your subsequent experiences with psychedelics and other things well i think jung's ideas were of strong influence you know on our our ideas you know the ideas about that there is a collective unconscious that you know archetypes are a real a real thing that kind of underlie both uh you know individual and and, and cultural uh you know idea complexes if you will uh so yeah i think i think jung was absolutely spot on with within the limits that that uh that he conceived it you know so uh here we are now and uh you know it, i mean it it's a fascinating <laughs> time to be alive you know uh, and because we are you know our culture is at the at the you know whatever is going on technologically and in terms of uh, cultural consciousness is the cutting edge of of this collective evolution, this collective uh, evolution of consciousness. And maybe it is headed towards some sort of singularity, some sort of fusion of consciousness, you know, a la childhood and childhood's end and those, those sorts of scenarios. Uh, 
perhaps it will perhaps humans really will become obsolete or irrelevant you know or you know give rise to maybe the next stage in evolution has little to do with biology you know we just don't know at this point we just can't really say and uh so it's both exciting and uh you know, in some ways, there's tremendous uh, reason for optimism and and equally tremendous reasons to be very, uh, well, very careful about it. You know, uh, I wouldn't say f- be afraid of it. I don't think being afraid really accomplishes much because uh, fear tends to just paralyze us, you know. But we should be very cautious, I think, about the way that we deploy these technologies, you know, because, uh, because, because, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the moral frameworks uh, that these technologies operate in, AI and so far, uh, may not be compatible with our idea of, you know, what is good, true and beautiful. You know, uh, and uh, so it's not clear. You know, we just have to be, we have to keep our eyes open. We have to keep our powder dry and we have to, you know, look at these things, uh, not get sucked in. And and the thing is, these these, uh, technologies are so inherently seductive and uh fascinating it's hard to keep your perspective you Mm know did um was terence always taking psychedelics on a fairly regular basis in his adult life or or did he stop at some point well he kind of he kind of stopped uh in the early 90s he he stopped uh or he stopped taking them very regularly uh he had some experiences that were very unsettling to him, I think, on a personal basis. And that really uh, kind of brought him up short, you know. And, and he, he uh, you know, from the early 90s on, he was not taking them so much. He didn't entirely stop, but there was a point where I think uh, – uh, well, I don't know exactly, you know, what what the dynamic was behind that. I think that, probably shouldn't say this, but I will, I think that at a point, he, his experiences stopped being about this, the other, if you can think of it that way, and started being about himself, you know, and I think the psychedelics have a way of putting a mirror up to the self. And that can be very uncomfortable uh, for some people. It can also be an opportunity to look at yourself and, uh, you know, examine your, uh, you know yourself and and see some of the uh, some of the warts if if you will and if if that's not comfortable for you if it's uncomfortable then you know the tendency is to step back from that to step away from that but i'm not terence so i can't really say i can only say what i've seen from the outside one, you know, you guys, you have so much experience with psychedelics firsthand and, and just in your professional life as an ethnopharmacologist. You know, one of the, the major questions today around psychedelic medicine and a lot of the very promising, very exciting clinical 
results that have been had with things like MDMA, with things like psilocybin, is um, you know whether the therapeutic effects depend at all in any significant way on on the psychoactive effects, whether the whether 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 the trip itself, the psychedelic experience itself is mm -hmm. um, therapeutically efficacious. Uh, what are your thoughts on that based both on your own psychedelic experiences and, and your experiences around the world, as well as your knowledge of you know the nuts and bolts of how these things work on the pharmacological level? Well, uh, uh, yeah, I, I strongly believe that, uh, that these uh, efforts that are going on to uh, reverse, you know, to engineer the psychedelic experience out of the molecules, there are a number of people that are working that at, on that. And it's like, I think it's a non-starter. I think it's a complete misunderstanding of the therapeutic uh, efficacy of psychedelics. I mean, I think if you, you can probably make molecules that will have no perceivable uh, psychoactive effect and that may reset receptors or change, you know, certain, certain systems on the neurological level. Uh, but I think that for lasting benefit, I think the, the experience of the psychedelic is really essential. Otherwise, you know, you can make these drugs that do that, the non-psychedelic psychedelics. But we already have those, you know. I mean, they're, they're the whole generation of psychopharmaceuticals mm. like SSRIs that we already know, yeah, they do provide temporary relief and they're sort of band-aids. They don't really get to the problem. I think you have to have the experience and that is reflected. Those experiences as much as anything trigger the, the formation of new neural connections and, and different, you know, different connectivities that you don't have unless you go through the experience. But then I may be a, you know, old fuddy-duddy, uh, you know, 20th century person who says, yeah, you have to have the psychedelic mm -hmm. experience. One day, maybe not. You know, mm -hmm. maybe we'll have a whole new generation of drugs that – turn us all into bodhisattvas and we don't have to do any work at all. You know, it mm -hmm. just happens. I yeah. can't doubt it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, one of the ways that I think about this is a set, you know, more or less every form of neuroplasticity that's been studied and that we understand with any detail is experience dependent or activity dependent, meaning exactly. you, you need activity flowing through that particular circuit before it can change itself neuroplastically. And when I think people have, you know, when you go through some of these trials with MDMA and psilocybin and people are instructed to think about their addiction or think about their illness during the trip, what you're doing there is you're priming them to, uh, make the circuits that are problematic active during this experience, which is probably when they're most apt to be changed is when, you know, the drug is actually in the system and in the, in the immediate aftermath of that. And so yeah. I think when, when people have these lasting changes, it's probably because they are, um, they're being coached ahead of time through the, the therapy to, to think about these things, which amounts to activating just those circuits which need the changing and so i think yeah. if you engineer out the experiential component you're just making it you're making it less focused uh, on on those exact circuits um you might sort of tweak things across the board here and there but you're not actually focusing uh yeah. the yeah. activity dependent plasticity you know where things are actually problematic in in the brain I, I completely agree. I, I think that's exactly it. I think that the the therapeutic efficacy of, of the psychedelics is that they let you step out of your your so-called default mode network. You know, they they demolish the default mode network temporarily and they let you look they let you step away from your reference frame and look at your situ existential situation, whatever it may be, your relationship to addiction or trauma or depression or whatever it is, you see it from a different perspective and the default mode network will reestablish itself because the brain, you know, tends toward equilibrium. It will, it will fall back together, but it's like rebooting your computer. 
you know, and I've said this many times, you reboot your computer and it works better, you know, because you've cleared the kludge out of it temporarily, then maybe it accumulates again. But for a while, the system works more efficiently. And uh, I think that's exactly what's going on with the, which is why the psychedelics have such a broad, if there was ever a broad spectrum, you know, uh, psychotherapeutic uh, class of drugs, these are this, as opposed to the SSRIs or the anxiolytics or those sort of things. I, I very much think that that's exactly what's going on, that, that you have to be open to this experiential restructuring uh, that the experience itself facilitates. And then that becomes reflected in this neuropl these neuroplastic re reconfigurations. You know, I think that's what's going on. I mean, yeah, I, it's my my personal bias and belief that that's important. You know, mm -hmm. and maybe that's because, well, I, I believe it. Maybe that's maybe that's just my bias. Maybe ten years ago, we'll say. You know, people like me will say, well, damn it, we had to do all this suffering. We had to have these terrifying experiences and transformative experiences to get the benefit. And then the younger generation will say, no, that was necessary. It was a waste of time. You know, we had the right molecular monkey wrench. We put it in there and it tweaked the right receptors and we're fine. I'm waiting for it. I'm not expecting it. What, um, you know, as we start seeing like more and more clinical trials happen and eventually, you know, the certain psychedelic medicines get approved by regulators and more and more decriminalization happens. If we, if we assume all of that's going to continue and progress, how do you see like the landscape of uh, legal medical use of psychedelics co-evolving with people's personal use for, for unofficial reasons, you know, either recreational or, or spiritual or what have you? Well, it's tricky, you know. I mean, I, I mean, it, it, things seem to be diverging that way. Anyway, there seems to be the medical clinical track and the personal use track, or the you know, which is often associated with the uh, you know the ritual use, the more traditional uses. Uh, you know, and I, I think I mean both are going to happen. I mean, I think that. Uh, you know, I'm all for the clinical research and 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 that mode may work for a lot of people. And certainly it will it will advance our knowledge of how these things work. I do not believe that any substance, particularly any uh, natural substance, whether from whatever source, should be prohibited or inaccessible to people. Uh I think that people, prohibition doesn't work. I mean, if we haven't learned anything in the last part of this decade, the last decade, prohibition doesn't work. People want to take drugs. They'll find drugs. You know, what works is education. And people should be, have access to sources of education and they have should have the right to use any drug they want as long as they use it in a way that doesn't harm other people and they should be encouraged to do it in a way that is informed uh, themselves and not harmful to themselves, you know, and when it comes to natural substances, I'm, I'm very much, uh, you know, I've lately started to, uh, well, not so lately, but for the last few years, I've started to articulate the idea that uh, people have a right to symbiosis you know, and relationships with these natural drugs is a kind of symbiosis, mutual benefit. You know, we grow the mushrooms and they they get a benefit and we take the mushrooms and we get a benefit. So that's a good partnership. And we form those kinds of partnerships with all kinds of natural substances. And uh, it should be asserted that it is a that it is a fundamental right of living organisms to form symbiotic alliances. I mean, it's not even a human right because it transcends the human realm. It, you know, the right to symbiosis is a right of living organisms. 
you know, and of course that's, well, that's my view, <laughs> you know, it, it's not really put that way, but that's what I think. Um, you know, in, in your book, you obviously detail everything about your relationship with Terrence, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think no one with a brother, you know, it, it's always a, a mix of, of adversarial and, and brotherly and, and friendly aspects to the relationship. Um, what, what do you miss most about Terrence? What do I, what, what do you miss most about him? Oh, you know, I miss a lot about him. I mean, uh, you know, I, I miss his, I, I miss his sense of humor a great deal. I mean, one of Terence's virtues, one of actually many virtues that he had, but one of his chief virtues is with all these crazy ideas and wild speculations that he dealt with, he never took himself that seriously. I mean, he kept a sense of humor about it. And I think that's very important, you know. So I miss that. And I miss his his quick mind, you know, and his his ability to appreciate ideas, you know. I mean, he was the the propagator of funny ideas, you know, from the start. And and that's why people like Terence are dangerous because funny ideas are dangerous, you know, and he realized that and that's okay. I mean, Timothy Leary was the same kind of person, you know, there was so much cultural, you know, opprobrium against Timothy Leary because he had funny ideas and ideas are dangerous and people that don't appreciate ideas are scared of this. Terence was fearless in that sense, you know, and, uh, and he could present funny ideas in a way that was, uh, you know, that other people could appreciate. They could appreciate the humor of it and uh, in a way that wasn't threatening and yet that got people thinking, you know. And that was that was his talent. He could stimulate people to think and was very much a uh, advocate of the idea about the notion that people should think for themselves, you know, uh, and uh, ultimately you, you know, you have to do that. You have, you have to be confident enough in your, in your uh, sort of, uh, I, I don't know what the term is, your intellectual foundation to, uh, uh, you know, to trust yourself, which is different than cutting yourself off from other forms of information, you know, uh, so those are things I miss about him, you know, very much. But he was, uh, you know, he was a unique character. There will never be another Terrence McKenna. Are there any uh, final thoughts or, or things you want to reiterate for people, Dennis, about anything that we talked about today? Well, I, I think we pretty much covered it. <laughs> you know, we, we delved into it here. Uh I mean, I, I guess that would be the, my message, you know, uh, if anything, a couple of things, you know, trust yourself and, and trust your, your ability to, to think about these things in, in, a, in a way that's constructive and don't, uh, and keep your skeptical antennas well tuned, you know, and, uh, Always remember, I mean, if people say, what have you learned from psychedelics? You know, what's the main thing? The main thing I've learned from psychedelics is how little we know, you know, and psychedelics, my psychedelic experiences always remind me that. Remember how little you know, you know, which I think is, you know, we really understand any one person and as a species the universe is far more vast and experience and mysterious than we can imagine. And we only understand a tiny, tiny slice of it, you know, and that's good enough. I mean, that is what we understand. We can, uh, you know, try to expand the sphere of our understanding, uh, but we're not going to get it figured out. You know, I'm, 72 years old now, I'm pretty sure I'm not going to have it figured out by the time 
I pass on, but I'm grateful for, you know, what it, what I've been able to experience. And I think the, the world is astonishing and uh, uh, we'll never completely understand it. And, and I don't find that depressing. I find that inspiring in a way, you know, because there's always more to learn. All right. I think that's a, a great place to end it. Uh, Dennis McKenna, thank you for your time. This was very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nick. This was a great conversation. I really enjoyed this.